Um, my name is Danielle Gates. I am the Communications Director of the Internet Office Advisory Committee. I want to welcome you all today to Tracking Wireless Location Privacy in Kingdom's Home Law. Um, this is hosted by the Advisory Committee in conjunction with the Internet Office and its co chairs. Um, at this time, I'd like to introduce John Morris, who will be our moderator for the day, and he's going to be centered for the moment. So, come on, let's start. Thanks very much, Danielle, and thanks um, everyone um, for coming. The, 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 the title is Tracking Wireless Location Privacy, and, and the tracking part is really to you know, remind us that um, five years ago, in 2001, the Internet Caucus Advisory Committee had um, hosted a, a program back in 2001 on location privacy, and we learned a great deal then, um, although I'm not sure if, if many of you were there. Um, but a lot has happened since um, 2001, and um, I mean, it's really become, in 2001, I think the, the, the panel was really predicting that location services and location privacy issues were, were really going to be at the forefront of, of technology development, and, and I think we've seen that um, to be the case, and I, I think there's still going to be even, even bigger issues over the next five years. So, and since 2001, um, CTIA, the Cellular Telecommunications Internet and Internet Association, um, has implemented, released, and implemented its best practices. Um, it, CTIA also asked the FCC to initiate a rulemaking about location wireless privacy, um, uh, location privacy. Um, but the FCC um, issued certain rules on um, CPNI, customer proprietary network information. But um, the FCC decided it did not take the CTIA's invitation to issue special rules focused on location privacy. Um, there, there's also been a great deal of activity um, in the E911 space. That's what really sparked um, the, the, the action even five years ago was focused on E911 issues. And the FCC has been very active um, in the last five years on E911. <laughs> Going so far as, as even to, to, to propose um, last year, um, in, a, in a notice of the rulemaking, the possibility of even requiring devices to be able to be location aware, um, um, which would be kind of the most proactive regulation of on location issues. Uh, they actually have not done that yet, but, but at least the proposal is out there. Let me take a moment and just um, give a plug. Um, for another Internet Caucus Advisory Committee event um, on July 13th here in Rayburn, um, um, which will be showcasing, it, it, it's, it's the summer technology fair that the Internet Caucus puts on, and, and it will be showcasing um, emergency communications um, technology. And, and then most recently, there's been a lots of discussion over the past week um, about CPNI, um, Customer Propriety, proprietary network network information which does include location information because it's CPNI that the phone companies like AT and T and Verizon have been alleged to have turned over to the National Security Agency. And we don't really know whether that includes location information, although it probably does for the wireless companies. Um, we're not going to be talking today about the national security side of this whole all issue. We're really going to be more focused on um, company but certainly um, location privacy is, is, is a very important set of issues. And also since 2001, we've seen just an explosion of new and maturing wireless technologies. Um, you know, Wi-Fi networks were, you know, they existed in 2001, but now they're on, on almost every street corner and, and in a growing number of, of city parks and, and entire cities, and in, in some cases, are proposing to to, to create wireless networks. Apparently, um, the state of Rhode Island is um, trying to create a statewide wireless network. So, um, I mean, we've seen just an enormous explosion of wireless technologies. We also have you know, other technologies other than the straight um, narrow Wi-Fi. We have the Verizon's EDDO um, product. I suspect that. 80% of you have Blackberries on your on your belts right now, um, and um, and there are, there are new technologies like WiMAX, which may be um, getting deployed over the next few years. So I mean, we've certainly seen you know lots of new wireless technologies, and, and it's a little bit unclear what rules, what privacy. 
privacy rules um, apply to the wireless technologies, if any, and, and, and in particular, what rules apply to location. Of 
of location-based services, including um, the Speed Hive product, um, which I'm sure we'll hear more about, um, which offers the kind of the ability to have social networking with location-aware um, social networking. So your your BlackBerry would tell you that hey, a friend of yours is a, on the other side of the room, um, if you hadn't noticed, or just get down the hall. Um, but Jim is um, vice president for strategic alliances with Wave Market and. Before joining Wave Market, um, Jim had worked at, at Vodafone for a good number of years, one of the leading um, technology companies, and then when he was with um, AirTouch Communications, which now is um, Verizon, so he has a very a, a long history in, in the area of wireless technology. Um, and then finally, at the, at the end, is um, Mike Galchel um, of the um, of CTIA, which I suppose technically the name has changed now is technically the like, CTIA, the Wireless Association. Right, we're just using initials. Okay, so um, CTIA stands for nothing. Uh, right. <laughs> it used to stand for something. It used to stand for Cellular Telecommunications Industry Association. Mike is Senior Vice President and General Counsel of CTIA, which is the association for the wireless industry. And, and really under Mike's direction, as, as we'll talk about today, CTIA has been a very strong force um, speaking up for privacy protection within the wireless industry. Um, and before joining uh, CTIA, Mike has spent 10 years with the DOJ's antitrust division focused on communications issues. So that's a, a great panel. I'm, I'm going to somewhat play a double advocate role as a, as a privacy advocate in my organization, the Center for Democracy and Technology. It has been very active on um, advocating privacy issues in, in this space, and so I'll, I'll hope I'll ask a few pointed questions, but, um, but, but let me go down the line and ask um, Jed um, to start with giving us a, a quick overview of, of um, what he's working on. Uh, thank you very much. I, I appreciate being here, especially in this weather, because coming from Boston, flying out this morning, I'm sure you heard about the rain. I could swear FEMA was lining up animals two by two on the runway. So, um, the, the whole issue around privacy and location is, is actually very relevant to our business on, on almost a daily basis. Um, if I were to ask you to raise your hands, most of you would say over the course of last week, you've used a lot of this location-sensitive content that's out there. You've used Google Maps, you've used MapQuest, you've looked for directions, uh, you've tried to find something, or you've looked for locally relevant content, meaning you've looked for the pizza shop next door, or tried to find something that's near you. And all that content that's widely available to consumers nowadays has got a very, very heavy location context to it. What's really unique now in terms of what this technology is doing is now that you move past the Googles and the Yahoos and the Zagats and the Zandangos and the Yahoo movies, is the ability now to automatically identify somebody's location and put those two things together. Um, again, if I were to ask you to raise your hands again, probably very few of you have a GPS device, um, probably, and, and probably not even a GPS-enabled phone. But probably a very large percentage of you have Wi-Fi enabled laptops or desktops. And that's what Skyhook's kind of unique capability is and where things really get interesting for us on the privacy side because our technology allows you to take any Wi-Fi enabled or wireless enabled device like a laptop and turn it into a virtual GPS, meaning that um, the device that you use every single day running our software can actually pinpoint your location to within about 20 meters. That's including sitting at your desk or sitting at home. And the reason we do those things is because there is a driving consumer demand for that location content I talked about and for better access to that content. And we've married those two together at Skyhook in a number of different ways, doing things like E911 for voice over IP, uh, things like Vonage, um, things like fleet and asset tracking. But the unique thing we've really done is taken a whole Google search concept and marry that with our location technology for this product that John mentioned called Loki, L-O-K-I. And now what you can do is you can actually type in a simple search query and with our software it's going to automatically identify your location within that 20 to 50 meters and give you back very, very specific content based on your very specific location. Now that obviously raises privacy issues. Uh, we have very detailed privacy statements, um, policies and procedures at our company. We follow those to the strictest um, standards, but we also are bringing in other people, outsiders. Um, folks like Mike Liebel for the Institute for the Future, he's actually coming on as an advisory for us to help us think about how we make location even stronger in terms of the privacy model. 
things like quarantine location, allowing us to use it as a technology but not to have access to it. Um, so I think in the future, as the technology like ours becomes more prevalent and becomes more accessible to the average consumer, and the privacy issue is going to be, become even more important, and I think forums like this are going to be, be very relevant to the discussions that we have. Great. Thanks very much. I'm Jim. I'm going to move forward to you. As John mentioned, my name is Jim Smolin. I'm the Vice President of Strategic Alliances for Wave Market out of the Silicon Valley in California. Wave Market is notably the industry leader in providing location-based services and applications for the wireless marketplace. Since 2000, we have deployed all of our services and applications to the world's leading wireless operators. In the United States, that includes Sprint PCS, Verizon Wireless, Singular, and T-Mobile, who are all either currently deploying, have deployed, or are in active trial with one or more of our applications and services. Out of Canada, with Bell Mobility, who is the largest wireless operator, and TELUS, the second largest. Vivo, the largest wireless operator out of Brazil. And SK Telecom, the largest wireless operator out of South Korea. Our applications give you the ability to locate your family members, track your business assets and manage them remotely, find and match you up with your perfect date, and give you directions and locations of nearest restaurants, gas stations, and turn-by-turn -turn directions on how to get there. Most recently, we launched a service with Sprint Nextel, which is called Family Locator, which allows parents to locate their children's phones wherever they happen to be, as long as the phones are on the Sprint network and are powered on. We think that through the next few years, Location-based services are just going to blossom, both for the consumer and for the business users. These services and the privacy constraints that are, are placed upon us as a developer mostly come from our interaction both with our wireless carrier partners and through the industry consortium of CTIA. We either follow or exceed the I'm sorry. <clears throat> we, we either follow or exceed the mandates that are placed upon us, and we feel that the industry and the way that they're managing it is leading us to an area where we'll have better applications in the future. And in terms of uh, privacy and security, we believe that things are handled appropriately through the, currently, the current uh, industry symposiums. Excuse me. Yes, sir. Great. Thank you. Mike. Well, thank you, John, and I want to thank the um, Internet Caucus for inviting all of us and, and uh, having this program today. I've been asked to provide a little background as to what CTIA is, the Trade Association for the Wireless Industry, had proposed uh, going back to November 2000, uh, because the wireless carriers are regulated by the FCC and Congress uh, is, has made the FCC responsible for the rules that uh, apply to wireless carriers. We petitioned the Federal Communications Commission for some more specific rules that would apply to location privacy. It's a bit of history. In 1999, Congress passed the 911 Act. things. One, it made 911 the sole, only, exclusive emergency number for uh, for calling uh, peace apps. Uh, up till then, there had been a patchwork quilt of different numbers around the country. It also, uh, at Congressman Markey's uh, insistence, amended the Communications Act and added location information, location privacy, as a specific enumerated uh, element in the uh, area of what we call CP&I, Customer Proprietary Network Information. But all carriers, and this was specific to wireless carriers, have an obligation under Section uh, 222 of the Communications Act to secure this uh, proprietary customer network information, which uh, prior to that amendment 
had been call records, so kind of call detail information that's on your, your phone bill and in the news uh, right now this week. Uh, the 911 Act added location information for wire, wireless customers. So within a year of that amendment, the association petitioned the FCC to adopt some rules based on existing Federal Trade Commission best practices for privacy information. Uh, in order, uh, and I'll be very candid about this, in order to provide wireless customers with a uniform set of expectations as to how their privacy rights would be protected and therefore encourage the rapid development and uptake of location-based services. One of the other things that was going on at the same time is that the FCC, in a parallel rulemaking, had imposed a mandate on wireless carriers to deploy location-based 911 service uh, to all customers uh, across America so that in the event a wireless customer called 911, the a local dispatch center would be able to know the location the call was coming from. While no technology was mandated by the FCC, the wireless uh, basically uh, half of the carriers chose um, the triangulation system that John mentioned. The other half uh, included a GPS processor in the handset as a way of uh, locating consumers. And it was um, obvious that uh, commercial location-based services would take advantage of, of these technologies. What was uh, not included in the amendment to the Communications Act and was not included in the association's petition to the FCC uh, is the kind of location tracking information that carriers' networks uh, have always maintained uh, to uh, locate and complete calls. Uh, just by coincidence, although I live and work in Washington, after this lunch I'm going to be flying to Atlanta. Uh, as soon as I land in, in, in Atlanta at the airport and turn on my phone, my phone is going to register with a uh, wireless system in the city of Atlanta. That network is going to send a signal to my home switch here in Washington and a little notation is going to be made at my home switch that I'm in, I happen to be in Atlanta. Uh, and as I move from Atlanta to a suburb, uh, my location will be used in the network. So if somebody wants to call me, the call will find me. They won't be looking for me here on the Hill or DuPont Circle or in Arlington where, where I live. Uh, from the very first cellular call in Soldier's Field in 1983, wireless networks have kept track of where customers are within a, a, a fairly constrained but not a precise geographic location to be able to complete calls. That information has never really been uh, maintained. It's done in a write, overwrite, read, uh, overwrite kind of format. There is no need to archive it and in 1983 memory was very expensive. So the way the systems were created from the beginning is a notation is made, and as soon as the location is updated, the earlier location is overwritten and the current location is there. Uh, anticipating perhaps a question later, oftentimes when call bills are, um, are recorded for billing information, the originating cell site is recorded as part of the billing record, but it's not maintained by the, by the carrier's network. And it's done for sales tax purposes and geographic uh, separations that are important in uh, determining whether some calls are local or, or, or long distance. Uh, but we did not include uh, that this kind of network-based location uh, tracking uh, be part of the um, be part of our petition. Only the kind of commercial services that we heard the other panelists talk about. Another kind of location information. Was aggregate information, information that does not identify any individual user. There have been some proposals uh, to use uh, cell phone and, and, and other wireless phone calls. Uh, it's, it sounds like a disease, but as vectors on highways so that uh, instead of uh, you know, tracking uh, an individual car, you could actually see how quickly phones were traveling down the Interstate 95 corridor or not traveling if they were stuck in traffic. 
and looking at each of the transmissions as, an, as, a, as a point and measuring how, how fast or, or slow that particular beam was, was moving, you could get traffic information that would be more reliable than, than other kinds of reporting systems. Uh, but again, the um, information would not identify any unique user. It just would be individual uh, data points that could be used. So though, with, with those two exceptions, uh, CTI asked the FCC to come up with a set of rules, as I mentioned, based on well-established uh, Federal Trade Commission principles for privacy. Really, user consent is the key. Uh, if a user consents to uh, make his or her location uh, available to a commercial application, that should be the, we thought, the touchstone for policymakers. Consent requires meaningful notice. So we start with an obligation to provide a user with notice as to how a location would be used in order to provide the user with an opportunity to give consent. Uh, an additional part of the Federal Trade Commission policy uh, for fair information practices is security and integrity. Uh, Congress has had hearings in the last few months about the security of customer records. Uh, we've, we're all aware that there have been uh, data brokers uh, primarily using identity um, uh, theft who uh, through pretexting, get call records from, from carriers. Well, the security of information, customers' um, call records is part of the expectation that carriers would be held to keep that information secure and maintain uh, in systems with integrity and also to allow uh, customers to monitor the use and, and maintenance of, of the system. And finally, and, and, and most importantly, I think, for today's discussion, was the principle of technical or technology neutrality. The interesting thing as an unlapsed telecommunications lawyer is that the Com Communications Act, and in particular Section 222, applies to carriers. Carriers are a defined term, and it's the companies that you all think of as, as wireless carriers, such as Singular, Verizon, Wireless, T-Mobile, Sprint, Nextel, and the like. But they're not the only ones who are able to provide location information. Uh, many, if not most, cars now come with navigation systems, and many come with communication systems, uh, such as OnStar. And uh, those systems, when they're just using a wireless network as a customer, probably not carriers. We're going to see in the next year uh, pretty much all of the national wireless carriers deploying handsets that will both work on their licensed commercial wireless spectrum and also work off of uh, Wi-Fi hotspots. We don't want a customer who, is, who starts a call, say in a Starbucks, using a Wi-Fi hotspot and then steps outside and the call is handed off to a commercial mobile radio service uh, to have different privacy expectations. Again, we were concerned at the very beginning that customers have a uniform uh, set of privacy expectations that would really facilitate uh, the uh, success and, and customers embracing these services because we understood that if customers were afraid that their location information would be misused, they would not sign up, they wouldn't subscribe for these innovative services. So we wanted a uniform, uh, technology neutral set of rules that will apply to all location based services. I think that's really all I want to say by way of background. The final piece of the puzzle, which I think brings us to today, that are obtaining comments from uh, industry, privacy groups, citizens, and the like. Uh, the FCC in July of 2002 declined to grant our petition, thought that the existing statute was clear enough and that they didn't want uh, preemptively before services evolved and problems appeared to anticipate problems and have rules that may or may not have been appropriate for it. So uh, we currently have the, uh, the 1999 amendment that includes location privacy in the Communications Act that applies to carriers. 
but uh, none of the other principles that we had asked the FCC to adopt. However, as the panelists did mention, uh, the wireless industry through CTI has voluntarily and unanim unanimously adopted these principles as voluntary best practices. And all of the carriers and, and our members have adopted and are following them, even in the absence of rules. Before getting into kind of the real debate about privacy, let, let me just ask a couple of follow-up questions to Chad and Jim about the products they offer. Um, Chad, I, I, I think probably folks have an understanding of GPS, basically, and an understanding of cell tower triangulation. But can you just take a minute and, and explain the Wi-Fi tracking? Is that really kind of triangulation on the Wi-Fi signals? or how? Very quickly, how does that work? Same exact principle. So GPS works on the idea, and so does cell tower triangulation, that um, you have fixed known points, that being satellites or cell towers. You introduce an unknown device into those that make code, and it does reverse triangulation to pinpoint it. We do the same exact thing, except we use the Wi-Fi access points. And there are 40 million of them in the U.S. Uh, there are 500,000 of them in downtown Chicago alone. We know where they are. We know where the fixed location of those Wi-Fi access points are. So by introducing a Wi-Fi enabled laptop, PDA, dual mode phone, any of those things into that environment, you do the same reverse triangulation to get accurate location on top of it. Okay, so, so just to be clear, I mean, you don't have contracts or agreements with those Wi-Fi bases. You just, you've sent a, a car down through the streets and figured out, okay, the Wi-Fi network name no. Right. So we currently have 200 people driving around the United States, every single street, alley, and block. Within a cover area, by the end of uh, this summer, we'll map to 75% of the U.S. population. Okay. So there's a three in four chance that um, we'll be able to find your location if you're running our software on that Wi-Fi enabled device. Okay. Great. And then just for, again, very briefly, um, and the Street Hive product, which is your social networking product. I mean, it, it basically, am I correct in understanding that that's what, that kind of allows you to look at your PDA and see which of your friends are nearby? Is that? That, that oh, should, I, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I switched. Um, uh, hold on a second. Let me hold on a second. Loki. Lo, lo, yes. I, I apologize. Loki is, the, is your web-based location. Right, so that's available in terms of introducing location-based services to the market. You can actually download it for free, and we have a lot of people who are using it already. I mean, you know very healthy six figures. And basically what it does, it takes your Google search bar and it marries it with your automatic location so that when you search for anything, it automatically matches the two of those together. It has a lot of other things in it together as well in terms of like pages or favorites or bookmarks that are already built into it. You can email your location to people. There's a lot of functionality in that, but it combines the two, internet content plus the location. Okay, let, let me turn to Jim and ask him about the Street Hive product. Sorry to confused, get, get you clipped. Just a little bit more just to kind of explain to the audience how it works. Okay, re regarding Street Hive, what we noticed during a number of different focus groups, both uh, across a wide variety of, of, of sexes, age, um, you know, where they were born and raised, whether they were technically savvy or not, we noticed two main things. People who are in their mid-40s, like myself, generally don't want others to know where they're at. <laughs> However, 14-year-olds to 25-year-olds want everybody to know where they're at. They want to know their friends, they want their friends to know exactly what they're doing at all times of day. We've had people sending out hundreds of text messages during a two and a half hour focus group. The, the, the phenomena of, of MySpace and the social networking on the web made it an obvious choice for us to also look at social networking on the mobile. People, you know, the majority of, of kids, at least out in the uh, metropolitan areas, generally carry one of these around. I don't know how many of you have children out there. My daughter had one at the ripe age of 10. She's now 14, she's on her third cell phone. I have a 12-year-old son, he's got a cell phone. My nine-year-old is clamoring and I'm <laughs> All right. At that age group, it's for socializing. The, the youth of today tend to do more instant messaging, either from a mobile phone or over a uh, AOL IM or Yahoo or MSN, versus email. They want to, in, they want instantaneously to let people know what they're doing and how much fun they're having. What Street Hive does is it allows 
a user to download the Street Hive application onto their phone and from that application either determine their location via assisted GPS or they can uh, triple tap in off of the keypad where their location is at and from that point on they can upload to a website everything that they're doing they can take pictures with the phone if they're if they're in a nightclub you know take a picture of the, of the latest and greatest band they could notify their friends of where uh, Wi-Fi hotspots happen to be anything that you want any type of communication that you want with your friends you can upload the the Street Hive website allows you to look at what has been publicly uploaded from individuals if I, for instance, want to upload, you know, some, uh, you know, the, the latest rock band that's playing at a, at a club, but I only want my friends to note it. I can go, and, I can upload that and mark it private, and only my friends who are in, I don't, if you will, an online address book that I set up, have access to my postings. Great, thanks. Um, Mike, let me ask you, I mean, back in 2001, one of the points that CTIA made was that without kind of a national set of clear privacy rules for location, um, there'd be a kind of a, a hindrance to the deployment of technology, location technology. Mm -hmm. ha have you seen that, or ha how has that really played out um, in the market? Well, the, I think the industry in rallying around the industry best practices has provided a uniform set of customer expectations. Um, but we have seen in a handful of, of states, individual state uh, legislative proposals that would have would impose a, a patchwork quilt and for a mobile service that would, uh, again, uh, confuse consumers as to what their rights or expectations were. None of them have been, been passed happily. Uh, we've also seen, as often happens, that the uh, first of these uh, services were done in the commercial context. So, for example, uh, fleet operators have for some time been able to monitor the location of their trucks uh, so as to be able to dispatch the nearest vehicle to pick something up or, or make sure that someone's not off on a frolic and, and, and detour hopefully all with the um, employees' consent that they're being monitored. And uh, now we're seeing the um, first of the sort of widespread commercial applications that are being done out, out, outside of a commercial context, so, so for families. At our recent trade show, uh, Disney announced, and so did Sprint, uh, family-based uh, location monitoring products that really will allow, in addition to the social networking, uh, parents to be able to monitor location of, of their children. <laughs> John, John, if I, if I could sure. add in, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Wave Market has launched with Sprint the Family Locator application, which is commercially available today. Uh, the launch was approximately three weeks ago, and it allows parents utilizing their phone or via a website to go and, and location and, and locate their children. Um, the, the privacy aspects of it that we've implemented it might be a little bit different than what the industry might have been expecting. Uh, rather than keeping everything closed, when, when a child is located, when the child's device is located, we're notifying everybody, open kimono. When the parent, it, let, let's say a two-parent household plus a nanny, locates Junior. If the nanny's locating Junior, both parents get a text message that the nanny located Junior and where Junior was, lo was at. Plus, Junior gets a text message on his phone stating, nanny just located you. So everybody knows. Same thing, same thing you know, regardless of, of what parent, nanny combinations, grandparent combinations you have, whenever that child gets located, the child is notified of it, and the parents are notified of it. That way, the, the, the issue of, geez, is somebody locating me or is somebody not locating me, we, we try to just wipe the slate clean on that. Let, let me ask both Chad and Jim. Um, I, both of you, in, in your opening remarks, you know, stated that you really believe your companies believe and, and, and follow strong privacy 
principles. But, but I was surprised that on your main websites, neither of the websites had even a, had a privacy policy. So um, let me ask you both. Um, one, can you tell us a little bit more detail exactly you know, what you promise to protect for your customers and how they find out about that since it, it's not clearly on your website? So if you, on our website, if you do go to the bottom, there is a link that says privacy statement. Uh, right at the bottom of the website. I don't think so. I, I was there last uh, night, but okay. Yeah, right at the bottom of it, there's a bunch of things. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. The other thing is that when you do go to download it, um, the application it clearly states that it's, you're protected under the privacy statement with a link there, uh, and there's a separate page as well. Um, and the privacy statement, in the way that, the, in particular, the Loki application works is, um, it states very clearly that we do not track your location. We have no idea where you are. There's a very anonymous and private connection between you and your device and giving location. We do know that somebody somewhere out there has asked for location, but we have no idea who that person is. Um, so all we do is generate a latitude and longitude. Um, that's also quarantined so that we cannot go in and do aggregation or anything else to actually track users or do anything. Um, so the privacy statement is there and it's part of the, actually the download process. Um, and we had actually vetted that through a couple of different organizations, some folks that work with EFF and some others, um, so that we wanted to be very clear that if people were opting in, and there's a very clear opt-in to use the technology, that we had a very stated policy behind that in terms of how we treat the technology. Okay. Now, our, our privacy statement is actually we're an engine powering a, an application for the Sprint brand. So when the user goes to download the application and register on the Family Locator website, there is a policy statement. Also, in order for them to use the application, it's downloaded onto your phone. They first have to go and accept terms and conditions, which include the policy statement prior to ever getting activated on the account. So they have to clearly acknowledge that you know, this is utilizing location-based data, and here's what location-based data means. OK. Um, is Street Hive, is that a product you sell directly to consumers? Uh, Street Hive, we, we, we always partner through, through carriers. Okay. So Street Hive right now, uh, anyone can go to streethive.com and register on the web and utilize it. If you wish to go and utilize the location piece, which is downloadable through the phone, you then have to go through one of our carrier partners and download the application. Okay. Let, let me ask the whole panel about um, something that I, I think probably concerns consumers a great deal, and that's um, kind of unsolicited ad advertisement being kind of pushed down to your phone. So, Mike, let me start with you and just ask, you know, CTIA's privacy principles, would, um, would that permit um, unsolicited ads, or how, how would that be addressed by your principles? Well, the principles don't uh, address it other than allowing a lot of flexibility. So uh, much like uh, in the broadcast world, uh, we all have a choice of seeing so-called free broadcast TV, TV that's, that's advertised or sponsored. And then there are cable offerings where we subscribe and may not be advertisers sponsored. Uh, we have not foreclosed either model or, uh, for, for wireless, uh, but we would expect that customers uh, understand uh, what kind of service they're going to be getting. Jim? Um, well, when it comes to advertising on the mobile, it, it, it's, it's actually a, a very dynamic space right now. There, uh, I read recently about a, uh, a new wireless company, a new startup, who's potentially going to provide free wireless service as long as you agree to go and read advertisements on your phone. Is that a bad thing? I necessarily, I don't, I don't think so. We'll, we'll see if the, if the market would accept it. But um, advertise, advertisements out there everywhere in front of all of us. We, we all either have a, a logo on our shirt or uh, when, we, when we do a, a Google search, we're being advertised to. It's, I, I think it's, the question is whether or not you allow advertising to a mobile consumer versus spamming to a mobile consumer. And that's the differentiation that we need to keep in place. If, if I'm providing, let's say, a local point of interest for free, and I have a paid advertiser within my local point of interest, and since he's paying, I, 
I show his icon. Uh, I, I show, let, let's say, the logo of his company. Um, technically, that's advertising. Is that intrusive to the end user? Probably not. But it helps drive more business to that one particular merchant. Just as in, in a web search, you've got paid ads on the side. If, if somebody is sending me a text message that um, I did not want, saying, come eat at Joe's for you know free beer or 99 cent cookie sandwiches, and I don't want that text message, then I'm upset. So I think it really depends on the context of what's coming in. Spam versus something which is really more helpful to the consumer and less intrusive. Okay. Sure. And I, I agree with the last part of it. I mean, it has to do with two things. It has to do with really a, and at least a, an implicit opt-in, meaning that you are using a technology that has a component to it which may deliver advertising, like a Google search does. And then it has to be relevant. Um, you know, Google has built a very successful business because they do provide advertising based on the relative context of somebody's search. So when you talk about adding location, then the idea then becomes as long as you're using a service and we're actively exploring putting advertising into Loki that will be opt-in. Um, if you're using a service that uses location and you're looking for relative context, um, then promoting the fact that there's a Starbucks closer to you than a Dunkin' Donuts or because of your location, you fit a particular demographic profile that matches better to a type of Visa card versus a type of MasterCard. Um, as long as it's unobtrusive, relevant, and presented in the correct way, I, there should be nothing wrong with that. We've all been watching television forever, and it's become something that, if it's done relevant and in the context, it's okay. Well, let me ask more specifically. I mean, would either of the, any of the products that you offer? Um, um, essentially, ever create a situation where my wireless device would ring just to tell me an advertisement? I mean, I can, I can certainly understand if I'm saying, you know, where is the closest Pizza Hut, I also might be told where the closest um, uh, Starbucks is. I can, I can, I can understand that. But, um, but is someone going to kind of intrude on that? Certainly not for us. I mean, because, I mean, one, it's just bad business. Um, you know, we don't want to be lumped in with the Nigerians in terms of the spam that people get pushed with. Um, and the key thing is, is that you want to do things that are an acceptable relationship. So if someone is using a particular location product of ours, then that advertising has got to fit into that context. It would never be pushed out. Um, because, you know, that's just from a business perspective, it's, it's, there's so much negative connotation that you want to steer clear of. We, we partner behind the carrier brands. If we did anything like that, we'd be cut off at the knees quicker than you could ever imagine. I mean, it's, nobody, nobody wants an upset customer. And you know, the, the wireless carriers spend a lot of time and money and energy to keep their customers happy and to attract new customers. And they're not going to let um, a, a, a company, a, a third party, go in and damage that relationship that they've got. Okay, let, let, let me, let's, let's turn to the topic of, of data retention, not so much the data retention that some folks in Congress are proposing um, to you know, require carriers to, to retain data, but, and, um, Jeff, am I correct in understanding that I mean, if I was a customer, or if I used the Loki product, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have any record of where I was, is that true? Yeah, so what we, the first thing you have to understand is we have no record of who you are. So everything is completely anonymous. So just from a technical perspective, you download Loki and an anonymous key is generated at that point. And we have, collect no information on who you are. Now we track calls that are made to the system for logging purposes and technical purposes. Um, and we can look at that key for those types of things. But we don't retain those for any longer than about 14 days. So they do get read right out as well. Because we can't identify any particular location or, or an individual on that, it has got somewhat irrelevant for us. So at least theoretically, if law enforcement came to you and said, we're tracking Loki by peeking at the laptop, but if this key is this, then theoretically at least could provide some data. background. And, it, and that's, it is a very interesting debate we were in this last week about that very topic. And then what we're finding is we fall very much into the, into the, to the same realm with the carriers where if they, they first of all have to be able to identify with great specificity the user. They can't have sort of a general idea of somebody. The other thing is is that they have to have, um, 
uh, what is basically a search warrant. They can't just subpoena us for the information because they've got to tie it to an individual. They then have to come to us with a certain level of, of, uh, of, of uh, proof to be able to generate a search warrant to be able to track that. Okay. D Jim, d does, does Wave Market retain data on where people have been? Um, very similar to, uh, to Jet's comment. We do um, hold on to data, which is called, for, in, in our line of work, we use it as breadcrumbing, which shows previous locations of where an, an individual happened to be. Uh, we hold on to that data for seven days and then write over it and, and blow it out of the system. And that's in accordance with, uh, again, our, our carrier partners and what uh, they prescribe to us. I think the key thing, of, though, which with what Jim's coming to do is you are opting in to use that service. You are opting in to tell people where you are. And I think that does express some level of understanding of what your privacy is. We have to be very sensitive to the fact that we are not allowing people to opt in to track their location. That, that creates a, a higher standard for us. Okay. Mike, do the CTIA guidelines um, address data retention, this kind of information? Only to the... Um, level I mentioned earlier with respect to the security and integrity of, of the um, of any information that that is retained would be retained and made available only to a customer who, who wanted it not to be marketed to a third party. Okay. And if I could uh, Please. just interject here, uh, on my statement of holding that data for seven days, that is solely um, accessible by the end consumer through their own as protected site access. So that's something that, that we have to do to look at. We don't know who that end consumer uh, happens to be, where they live, anything like that. that that's all kept separate from us. Um, all that we have is the account name and that um, they have initiated when they first logged into the system. Mike, let me go back and ask you, in 2001, you asked the FCC to promulgate some binding rules. Um, does CTIA still believe that um, some binding rules would be a, a healthy thing for the industry? We, whether we do or, 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 or don't, we don't uh, anticipate that the FCC would be any more open to the idea today than they were uh, then, so nothing's, uh, nothing's planned. Okay, let me come back to Jed and Jim and ask, I mean, neither of you probably are a carrier under the Communications Act, so um, am I correct in thinking that there aren't any national rules that restrict you from, uh, that force you to protect it? Is that, is that right? From a big market perspective, our rules come from our customers. Our, our, our number one customer happens to be the carriers, and they pass along to us what they have defined by either, you know, the FCC or, or um, what they've agreed to with the CTIA. So I indirectly, um, we, are, we are governed by the same rules that the carriers govern themselves by. We're just a bunch of really nice guys. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and it, it, and it almost is that way. I mean, we really, uh, there are no rules for us. There's nothing that applies to us. We are outside the realm of regulation. Um, you know, the, the basic principle that, that is driving us now is capitalism, the fact that I've got four kids, and the fact that we want to make a successful company, we have to be very, very uh, responsive to the market and to the consumer. Um, that doesn't mean that we're not proactively getting involved to try and look at, if not at least federal regulation, but at least what um, standards are set by watchdog groups, people who are very interested in issues about privacy, start, you know, give us guidance and direction so that we meet at least their standards. Great, thanks. Um, in just a moment, I'm going to open it up to questions from the floor. Um, but, but before I do, I'm actually going to ask the audience a question, but actually ask one specific person a question. Um, Miriam Shapiro of um, Summit Strategies International is here, and, and she's been very active in um, working on internet policy issues in Europe, um, really across the globe. But, but so I, I guess Miriam, if you could just give us a minute overview of, um, of kind of how the location privacy issue is being played out in other other parts of the world. Yeah, why don't you come on. Thanks, Jeff. 
out. Um, at one point, we talked about even having an international perspective on the panel, but we thought for um, this first panel on the subject, uh, since it had been a while since the uh, caucus and uh, staff had been updated, uh, it, we would focus just on more of a domestic perspective. But I promised John I would say a few words internationally. As you, some of you may know, um, Europe has been working very hard to uh, develop a cohesive regulatory framework, uh, both the Commission and the member states. And uh, I consider them the real trendsetter uh, in the area of data privacy in general, and specifically on this topic. Uh, because in 1995, they came out with what I sometimes call the mother of all directives. It was the European Data Protection Directive, which in 1995 was really quite groundbreaking in terms of governing the processing of personal data and uh, the free movement across borders of such data. In 2002, uh, the European Parliament and the Council updated this directive specifically with respect to electronic commerce when they came out upon privacy and electronic communications. Uh, that was in 2002, and Article 9 is really quite specific on the issue that we've been talking about. I'm just going to cite a couple of provisions briefly because I think they would be of interest to you. Um, Article 9, Section 1, talks about the uh, requirement that location data, other than traffic data, may only be processed when done anonymously or with the consent of the users or subscribers, and only to the extent necessary and for the duration necessary for the provision of any value-added service. The service provider has to inform the user or the subscriber prior to obtaining their consent, so it's truly informed consent, of the type of location data which would be processed and the purposes and the duration of the processing, and whether that data would be sent to a third party. Users and subscribers can, uh, at any time, they must have the possibility to withdraw their consent for the processing of this data. Uh, I think it would also be of interest to know that the second part of that article um, talks about when consent has been obtained, the user subscriber must continue to have the possibility, using simple means and at no charge to them whatsoever, of temporarily refusing the processing of such data for each connection to the network. Uh, so it's really quite groundbreaking. That was done uh, in 2002. Um, it's really a uh, very clear-cut provision, not at all open-ended. Um, um, what kind of information has to be provided and how the user and subscriber can tailor uh, their consent. Uh, a little more recently, in 2006, earlier this year, the um, Commission also promulgated a directive on data retention. Uh, John referred to that subject uh, a few minutes ago. And there are provisions in there on the um, uh, location information that we've been talking about on the mobile location uh, data that carriers do have to retain uh, for a limited amount of time, but there are also restrictions on that. Um, I'll just say a few words about Japan, uh, which has also been uh, at the forefront of countries trying to grapple with the issues we've described today. Japan has a constitutional history of, I think, all the way back to 1946, which of course is a relatively new constitution that the United States government helped draft, but at the same time, nobody in that era could foresee the mobile and wireless uh, communications issues that we've been grappling with today, so it obviously doesn't address it. But they have enacted uh, legislation that deals with personal privacy, and then more specifically on this subject, they uh, enacted in 1998 some guidelines on the protection of personal data that also require informed consent by the subscriber or the user. So there are different ways that governments uh, and um, International bodies have tried to deal with this issue. Um, obviously, there's legislation, there's self-regulation, also education and awareness, which we're hoping to do today. Um, and then there's also the possibility of international cooperation. And at least for the United States, uh, the OECD 
and um, APEC, Asia Pacific uh, body and fifty plus European and US countries have really worked very hard on privacy issues and I think they would um, probably be you know two of the bodies that would be starting to look at these kinds of, of issues in the weeks and months ahead. Great, thanks very much. I'm going to ask one more question. It's kind of a, a wish list question before we open it up. Um, and, and that's that I, I know that there are some technical standards bodies that have been designing um, capability to allow users to find your control of their location information so that, you know, I can set a rule that says, um, you know, my wife and my mother can find out where I am seven days a week, 24 hours a day, but my boss can only find out where I am, you know, five days a week, and maybe on weekends, my boss can find out what city I'm in. Uh, do, do any of you guys um, see that kind of product really, you know, coming onto the marketplace and being available? Well, the Disney service is very close to that already, uh, what's been, uh, what was just announced. And there are a couple of vendors that uh, have recently announced handsets that actually would uh, control that information based on the customer's own control. It wouldn't reside in the network. And that would be another way of addressing these concerns. Jim, okay. Yeah, actually, I believe that there are, there are handsets already entering the market that have a, have a small application running on them that allow that, uh, that type of scheduling, if you will. Well, one of the, the main players in instant messaging, AOL, um, is going to add the idea of presence. So right now, the idea of online and offline, well, soon they're going to have the ability for online at work, Starbucks, friend's house, by location. And there's been a lot of thought going into um, what they're basically referring to as a radius control. Um, so that people on my super buddy list can see exactly where I am, but on a semi-buddy list or, or a public list, they may see that I'm in Massachusetts or maybe in Boston. So at the user level, they're very concerned about the idea of, of it's great if the technology can pinpoint your location. How you choose to share that has got to be a user-defined control. Great. Well, that's like a good news. Um, let's open up to, to questions. We don't actually have a mic, but if you could stand up and, and speak loudly and also um, identify yourself if you're with media or with, a, with an office here. Um, who has questions? Uh, John McGuffey with the Customer Security Committee. I just wanted if you would elaborate a little bit on uh, the story, John, that you had when you were first speaking about the, um, the car rental company. Oh. <laughs> Can you just give us a little background and, and how, uh, a little background about how that Sure, I can give you an article on it if you, if you want, but the, the, the quick answer is that a, a, um, a, a non-name brand of a rental car company in New Haven, Connecticut, rented a van that had GPS capability to someone, um, and in the, at the top of the contract it says, we use GPS capability to enforce these rules, but they didn't really read the rules all that carefully, and um, but by the time the... Um, person returned the van, he had been charged three $150 um, charges because the GPS um, technology indicated that he was driving over 80 miles an hour, exceeding the speed limit. Um, and he was obviously very upset. Everyone sued each other. I'm actually not sure what happened in, in, in the lawsuit. But, um, but I mean, that's an example of, I mean, really, most importantly, where there was not sufficient notice that, you know, maybe it's something that I mean, car rental companies do use GPS technology to track their fleet, but um, at least as of 2001, all the major companies were, were saying that, that they would not, they do not use it, and they don't have the capability to use it to track the customers. Just uh, you know, to kind of keep track of their behavior. Just you know, one anecdote that's close to that, and it sort of sets the difference between a public and a private organization. Uh, in Massachusetts, when they introduced the speed pass, they had begun to introduce legislation that said that they would time you between the toll booths. And that clearly was a violation of people's rights as a government authority to go ahead and track your location for the purposes of finding you criminally liable for some action. And that died pretty quickly. Although I remember 30, 40 years ago on the main turnpike, I actually think they used to do that. With no technology, it was a paper ticket that you know, said you entered the exit one. And you know, 20 minutes later, you left 
exit, you know, seven, but hadn't, you know, had done it too quickly. You know, so, um, uh, well, let's see. Other other questions? I'm sure there. Uh, one in the back. Um, my name is Lord and he's been my supervisor. He's our boss, basically. <laughs> Certainly. Um, I have a question about um, what constitutes opt-in. We talked a lot about opt-in, opt-out, and, and the CTIA standard is opt-in, and, and the CPI rule for the FCC is kind of opt-in, maybe brought down. The European Commission rule is opt-in, as in Japan. But what we've seen, I think, through this course of the ad word debate here in Congress is what constitutes um, opt-in um, is, is kind of a fuzzy thing. So. When it comes to the sensitivity of being you know, tracked by, whether it be a third party like Loki or, or Wave Market, or, or even being tracked by you know, one of your social networking buddies, um, who you think is a, you know, a friend, um, is that, I think the question of what really is opt-in is very important here. And is that, is that opt-in where in, in writing you have to send to the carrier or to Loki you know, your consent? Um, or is it an end user license agreement that has all different terms? Um, is it just checking a box at the end of the menu? How does that, how does a mechanism work? How does that um, help us stop the bill? I know that when we looked at it, we wanted a flexible standard because there's such a range of, uh, of customer expectations. And all this uh, from the CTI petition stems from 911. And it's hard to believe, but uh, as recently as 10 years ago, there was concern that the wiretap laws would prevent PSAPs from acting on location information that they didn't receive through a court order because the wiretap laws prevent the government from getting this kind of information. And uh, the Federal Communications Commission actually obtained from the Justice Department an opinion letter saying that you can imply opt-in or you can imply consent when a customer dials 911 and asks to be uh, rescued or acting as a good Samaritan dials 911 and asks that somebody be dispatched to rescue someone else. So from the very beginning, at least of our involvement, there's been a recognition that there's really a continuum depending on the circumstances and, and fundamentally depending on how clear the, uh, the notice and expectation of the user is with respect to whatever location-based application they're involved in. Jim or Chuck? Actually, when you first mentioned, is it a, a paper opt-in, that whole thought sends a cringe down my spine of, <laughs> of, in the day of the internet, managing you know, hordes of paper with people just signing their name or, or checking a box on a piece of paper. Um, we, we, we use, we have actually three separate opt-ins for our service um, in, one is from our carrier partner and their terms and conditions having to be accepted uh, during the registration process. Separately, we have our own terms and conditions which have to be accepted. And then last but not least, when a, at least on the Family Finder application, when a, a parent wishes to add in one of their children's phones to go and locate, uh, they first have to send out a safety word to that device and the safety word then has to be responded to with the same word coming back to match it. So there has to be user interaction. Uh, so whoever owns that device has to know that, yes, I'm giving the authorization for my device, my location, to be provided for this service. Can I ask a question with regard to your street ad product? Essentially, once, once somebody has a phone and they have a friend that also has a phone, the social networking contacts a friend, um, they can ping each other directly, which says, do you consent to having this friend track you or, or be part of your street hive tracking? What, right? what, what happens on street hive is, that, is the, the, the user themselves, they can post up their information on an interactive map whenever they want to. Whether they keep it private or public is, is something that they choose off of uh, off of a menu structure, but then it's viewable on that web to everyone. If it is made private, then it's only the list that that end user created who can then see their data and also get that data downloaded to them when they come in uh, a near vicinity. I think that the concern about social networking sites, and there's been a lot of discussion around this mm -hmm. in Congress and elsewhere, um, can a 14-year-old or a 15-year-old consent to even posting 
private information or disclosing the location information to friends or buddies? Is that, is that something that, that we should allow them to consent, uh, opt in to and consent to? Yeah, the, you know, the, that's a very good question. It, it brings up the same type of question of, you know, a, a, a minor going into an internet chat room and all of a sudden typing in their address. Can you control that? I that I don't know if you can. That's that's a good question for you to you know, to investigate. I, I don't know. I honestly don't know how you can in, in a world of, of open communication um, how you can control what's what's going to be entered in on, on a particular text message or IM. Chip Chen, does the does the Loki product deal with kids in any particular way? That no, it, it actually this it's a nice. Example here because the open flexible standards that CTIA has promulgated, and, and then and then Jim gives a very clear example of a particular type of application. As developers, the opt-in really depends on the use case. So for ours, we are not as stringent on the opt-in because we don't share location with anybody else. It is only given to you to use on your device to bring content to you. So we're very clear that we use your location to be able to do that. Um, but it all happens on your device only and not at a central location, and no one knows where you are. So um, that level of interaction then drives us from a business perspective on the levels of T's and C's and opt-in that we should have. Okay. Uh, other questions from to an advertiser. An advertiser doesn't generally care where lo what your location is in the era of internet advertising. They really care about reaching a particular demographic profile. So there's an incredible amount of data out there that, that uh, from database marketers that say, you know, in this particular neighborhood, the profile is generally this. And an advertiser says, I want to reach a particular profile. So what we do is basically identify profiles and serve the profile up to a suite of advertisers who want to reach that profile. So the advertiser never knows the location of the person receiving the ad. They only know that we have delivered it to the type of profile of person that they want. And that's how we handle it on ours. Uh, uh, they know the number of advertisements that you sent. They know that it was sent to young, urban, single people um, it, uh, 1,500 times. That's right. And for, from our perspective, the weight market perspective, it, it's actually monitored as a, as a click-through, similar to uh, an internet. So somebody actually has to go over a particular icon or go over a particular um, bar on the display of the phone and click on that. That the, the phone then relays back that you know the request was made for that information. The information gets downloaded, and at that point, we then monitor the click itself, but not not the uh, the demographic of that mobile phone user. And do your servers how long do you maintain that data? Through the quite honestly, we don't we don't have a commercial service out there, so I can't answer that right now. But the driving force on that is going to be the billing cycle on how quickly the, the billing turnaround happens. Okay. Um, there is a question here. Miriam? Yeah. Um, just a, a question. If you can say a little more about the security, especially when you're dealing with um, the, uh, the paging system involving children's locations. I mean, a, a parent or an nanny sends a message, I've just dropped the child off at the uh, DuPont circle for a dentist appointment. What's the security on that? And can it be intercepted by, by other people? I, I don't quite think I understand what your question is. It, it, if somebody drops off a child and then and then the parent does a location check on that yeah, child? I'm talking about the location. So, for example, an Annie is sending a message to the parents, the child has been dropped off, or the child has been located in this, this area. And how secure are those communications? You can 
the, the, the communication to the nanny is the nanny, is, the, is the communication to the nanny and then to the parent is that in, encrypted um, while it's in transit? Is that is that one of the questions we're asking? Well, I can talk to the radio piece because we're primarily just using digital wireless, and it's. Uh, particularly in an urban area, surprisingly short range. So, to first of all, uh, we, we don't have the same problems with intercepting digital signals that we had with analog. They're not in the open, and they are, they're encrypted to begin with, being being digital. So that, uh, absent the kind of uh, very expensive and complicated equipment that only law enforcement has, not aware of any any interception of the over-the-air radio transmissions. And because uh, the cells are so close together, you'd have to be pretty close anyway to be able to, uh, to intercept that. Uh, once the transmission then goes through the public switch network or the open internet to a, a website that I suspect depends on access arrangements the website provider has, uh, has established. And, and in particular, the, uh, the family locator service that we have um, in place right now goes through the uh, the wireless network. It's not it's not really an, an internet related handoff or, or, or switch in terms of the location of the uh, of the child. So th that's why I, I had that puzzled look on my face when you asked your question. It, the uh, the use case doesn't really um, form into the service itself. The service that we have is. Um, Let's say you've got a 16-year-old who's into sports, and after high school, they go to the soccer field for practice. Um, what, what is that if you, you try to call the child, quite often their phone is in their backpack, it's in their purse, it's in a you know, lunch bag, whatever the kid be. It may be on a table or somewhere where they're playing, or even common. They look and see, oh, they come and call, and call and eat, they work. So our service provides peace of mind. It allows a parent to through, through a push of, uh, of a few buttons on either their phone, which then goes through the wireless network, which, which does use encryption, or through web, which is also using encryption, uh, allows you to go and pinpoint within a level of accuracy where that device happens to be. So it just gives you more peace of mind. There's not really, um, you, can, you can send, let's say, a text message, but again, that goes through the wireless um, the, the wireless network, not necessarily the internet. And whenever the internet is used, it's always encrypted. Okay. Um, any other question? Yep. Another question here? If I may, I know it's been a time, but yes. I wanted to go into the Congressional Research Service. And I wanted to expand the debate a little bit in the last many minutes. We've talked about existing technology and evolving technology for locations in the context of wireless Wi-Fi other adjacent technologies. I'm thinking in terms of legislation and policy that we need to think more broadly in terms of what might be considered intrusive technologies, which would include RFID, for example, which is another area that is very close to location technology and wireless. And also on the policy side of the issue of newer digital technologies such as digital video broadcasting for handhelds, which is digital TV, which would be an emergency alert system based on technology. So from a policy point of view, when we think about location technologies and policy and laws, the envelope or the box or whatever you want to call it needs to be bigger than just cell phones, Wi-Fi, and related. That's, and if Mike probably has some comments on that. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's a, a valid point. Very, very quickly, does anyone want to jump in? And My only comment, uh, particularly because I've known Linda for so long, and she's absolutely right. Uh, we don't live in a static world and in the kind of silos that uh, a cell phone does this and a laptop does that and an RFID uh, chip does something differently. Where we see convergence of cross public, private devices and, and everything. We do need to be thinking of all these issues together. Okay, let, let me ask a final question and asking for a one sentence answer from each of you because we've got to finish in about a minute. Um, you know, what, what, what's, the, what's the most exciting um, location based service that you see on the horizon, or, depending on your perspective, what's the most worrisome privacy concern in the location area that you see on the horizon? Um, here, why don't we start with you, Jeff? 
Uh, Loki is the most exciting. <laughs> now, um, I, I actually think the most exciting thing is going to be convergence. I think what you're going to see over the next 18 to 24 months is that more and more devices will have more and more accurate location capabilities to it, which will provide consumers more options to be able to use location as part of, of their everyday life, whether it's a cell phone or a laptop and it has a GPS chip in it and it's got Wi-Fi location. All of that's going to be very interesting over the next 24 months. Okay. Jim? Well, I'm, going to, I'm going to sound like an advertisement here, but, but the family locator services, uh, the, the services that are, are pointing more towards the consumer that are giving them peace of mind, letting them know where, where individuals happen to be at or where they're not at when they should be, let's say, at school, uh, I think over the next 12 months are, are just set to explode here in the U.S. Um, following on from that, we've had a lot of success with um, mobile dating or mobile um, matching in the, uh, the Asian market space using location and proximity, um, all done anonymously, of course, but it's, uh, you know, it's, it's taken off quite rapidly there, and I think that uh, the U.S. market is, is ready for services along those lines. All right, Mike, do you have the last word? I only have one sense, but I think that we're talking about social networking, mobile search, and these kinds of, of family presence, and, and all of them are going to be exciting. They're all coming to market now, and I think it's really going to change the way people think of wireless devices and capabilities. What's scary, I think, is not so much of the commercial abuses that we've been focused on historically, but basically the kind of creeps and, um, on the Internet who will take advantage of these capabilities.